and putting everything together. And then she did what she did for her gift. The next morning, when it was Christmas morning, the family opened up their gifts, and Dad did his last, like most fathers do, after watching the kids. And when he came to Alice's, there's this huge box wrapped elegantly, and it was just, it was almost perfect. And so he pulls it out from underneath the tree, and she says, Daddy, Daddy, this is my gift to you. And he pulls it out, and he opens it up, and guess what was inside? He saw nothing. So he was upset with Alice. He's like, Alice, what did you do? You wasted this beautiful box. It's very expensive, all wrapping paper, and there's nothing in here. And she said, oh, no, Daddy, you missed it. You see, I spent an hour last night blowing kisses into that box so that you have one for each day of the year, 365 of them. You see, Dad had missed the indescribable gift of his precious daughter Alice, right? And don't we sometimes do that with Jesus? Sometimes we miss the indescribable gift that Jesus is. Somehow, in all the festivities and the presents and the presentations and the personalities and everything else around Christmas, sometimes we miss out on Jesus. But see, the Father, God the Father gave us Jesus as the indescribable gift, the Christmas gift, much like Alice's to her father. And this is how he did it. First of all, Jesus was a prepared gift. I think sometimes when we think of Christmas, we think, hey, at Christmas time, Jesus came. And he was born to the Virgin Mary. He was lying in a manger and swaddling clothes. And that's true in his humanity. But God was not caught off guard. You see, way, way back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve made a mistake, and they fell to Satan's lie, and they sinned, and all of humanity fell short of the glory of God, God had Jesus Christ as plan A. He had Jesus Christ as plan A from the beginning, and he had prepared him in advance to be the indescribable gift. We see it in the life of Abraham when he took his son Isaac upon the mountain. And he said, the son said, Isaac said, Father, where, where's the sacrifice that we're going to give? And Abraham knew that God had asked him to sacrifice his one only son Isaac, our precursor of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide the sacrifice. But he wasn't talking about Isaac. He was talking about Jesus Christ thousands of years into the future. And First John, I mean, sorry, John 1.29 says, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In fact, the book of Revelation indicates to us that Jesus Christ was prepared in advance before humanity was, before the foundations of the world, to save us from our sins. So as the indescribable gift that Jesus is at Christmas, he is a prepared gift by the Father, God the Father, who gives God the Son, conceived by God the Holy Spirit, to a lost and dying humanity. Jesus Christ is the indescribable prepared gift for Christmas. Second, Jesus is the indescribable perfect gift at Christmas. You know, I don't know about you, but can you think back to your childhood? Think about the perfect gift, or maybe it's in your adulthood. You know, I knew one woman who got a Maserati for Christmas, and she said that was the greatest thing ever, and I said, well, I guess so. You know, it's a pretty expensive car. But most of us think back to our childhoods or our teen years, and we think about that perfect gift, that one that, that we just kind of drank in, that was like everything that we ever wanted. It met and exceeded our expectations. It was that perfect gift that our parents or our grandparents or a friend or loved one could give us. And we were so excited. And, and as parents and grandparents, don't we love to see our kids do that? We, we hope that we land that perfect gift for them. And when they open it up, you see the joy of children's faces. And they light up and they say, thank you, thank you. I mean, we live for those moments. Well, God the Father lives for the moment that you and I recognize that Jesus Christ is the perfect gift. You see, he was perfect before he came to earth. You know, John 1, we just looked at last Sunday, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, the Word being Jesus Christ. And then verse 14 says, He became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And when he became flesh, he was perfect too. The book of Hebrews is very clear that, that throughout his life, 
He sinned none. And, and the books of Peter say that there was no guile upon his lips. He never said the wrong things. And James 3 tells us that if a man never sins with his mouth, he's perfect in all that he does. And Jesus certainly was. He blessed people. People were drawn to him. Children wanted to come to him. Women came to him. Hardened soldiers, the centurions, battle-weary men came to him. The prostitutes came to him. The Pharisees came to him. The tax collectors. All walks of life were drawn to Jesus because he was magnetic. He was the one person in all of history that was a perfect fit for each and every one of us. No matter who he interacted with, both then and now spiritually in our hearts, he is the perfect gift for us, both at Christmas as well as every day of the year. Jesus Christ is that indescribable, perfect gift. And you know, we just read, or heard read to us by the Donovans out of Matthew 2, that the wise men came, right? It says that the wise men came, and they came from the east, and they came to see Jesus, and they followed the star that was over him, and they followed it all the way. And they learned of the prophecies, and they went to find him, and when they found him, what does it say they did? They bowed down. And they worshipped him. The thing that's significant about that is that the Magi were in fact kings and wise men. They were wealthy, powerful kings of the East, probably pagan idol worshippers. But they believed that Jesus was the one. And they came and they bowed down and they worshipped him. And they gave him gifts that signified that he was the perfect gift of Christmas. They gave him gold, which is a symbol of, of divinity. Whenever there was gifts given to a god, it was always in gold. Even in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid with gold. and Much of the temple was too. Gold represented divinity. It's also the gift of who? The powerful, the prestigious, the kings. It's the gift of kings. And so when they brought gold at Jesus' feet, they were saying, you are the perfect gift, and we're giving the best gift that we can to you, that you are king of kings and lord of lords. They also brought incense or frankincense, a very powerful resin brought forth from the gum of a tree that, that basically was aromatic and powerful. It was, it was a, a wonderful smell. And it was used in temples to worship God. In fact, in the Old Testament, it was commanded in Exodus 25 for the priest to use frankincense in the temple to keep it burning as a sweet aroma before the Lord. And they saw it burning in, in the book of Revelation. The bowl of prayers is burning, and it goes up before the Lord like incense. So it acted as a mediator of God's our prayers to God between God and man. And Jesus is the perfect mediator, the priest, the high priest, the last and only priest that acts between us and God, that mediates us to the Father. And then there was myrrh, the most significant of all the gifts. If you've seen that movie, the new movie a few years ago, four or five years ago, The Nativity, when the wise men come in that piece, they do a great job. And the last of the three wise men, the last of the three kings says, and myrrh, and, they, and he says it's for the sacrifice. You see, ultimately the birth of Jesus Christ, the perfect gift, the prepared gift, was to send him 30 years later to the cross where he would give himself as a ransom for you and I, that he would break his body and shed his blood, which we will celebrate in the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes, that we might have the opportunity for the free gift of eternal life. The free gift of eternal life. Jesus did that for us. Finally, Jesus was a personal gift from God the Father, an indescribable personal gift to us. Not just prepared, not just perfect, but personal. John 3.16 says that God so what? That he loved the world that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, right? If you put your full faith and trust in Jesus Christ to forgive you of the bad things that you've done in your life, your sins, then he will. In fact, this is what it says in John 1.12. As many as received him, to those who put faith in his name, who believed on him, he gave the right to become children of God. But it's a choice. Tomorrow morning when you open up a gift, if one of your children or friends or family or loved one or friend gives you a gift and you refuse it, it's not your gift. 
You have to receive it and open it and participate in it. And that's what Jesus Christ is. The perfect, prepared, personal gift for each and every one of us. He didn't just die for the sins of the whole world. He died for each and every one of you. As one of my professors once said, Greg, if you were the only one who ever lived, and he looked down through the corridors of time, he would have been born and died just for you. And that is true. He cares about each and every one of us, having a personal relationship with him. Jesus is that indescribable gift, much like Alice's kisses to her father. Jesus is the kiss of the Heavenly Father to us, that when we receive that and walk in His love and that free gift of eternal life, we walk in peace. Peace in our hearts with God, peace with our fellow man, peace as a community, peace as a world. And one day, Jesus will return in the second coming and He will institute perfect peace upon this land. Tonight we celebrate the first advent, the first coming of Christ. But there is a second coming, and he's coming with glory, but he's also coming with judgment. And so we need to receive Jesus Christ. You know, in closing, there's a story of, of John Getty, a famous missionary. He was a Scotsman from Nova Scotia, Canada. And in 1846, he came to Christ after being a pretty brutal man, a brawler, a fighter, a drunk a horrible man by his own admission in many ways. He struggled with his inner demons like many of us do, but Christ said that he loved him and, and moved his heart to accept him. And, and in 1846, he came to Christ and was forgiven and finally had peace in his soul and peace with his fellow men and spent two years of his life making amends to those who he'd harmed. But that wasn't enough for him. He decided that the Bible said that we were to take the message of Jesus, that indescribable gift to the whole world. And he thought, what is the farthest part of the world that nobody's ever touched? And he found this isolated island, Antinum, way in the South Pacific, near probably what you call Fuji. And basically what he decided is, I'm going to take a long boat ride. And he went, and in 1848 he went, and what he found was cannibalistic tribes that love to consume one another. He had a really rough road. He prayed. He worked. He served the Lord. He shared the word of God. He shared the gospel. He kept giving them Jesus and giving them the word and praying for them and loving them. And eventually, 24 years later when he died, this is what it said on his tombstone. It said, John Getty, 1848 to 1872. When he came, there were no Christians. When he passed from this world, there were no heathens. Basically, everybody on that island of those tribes have been Christianized. And the largest Presbyterian church in the southern hemisphere for the next 200 years was found on that island. That's the power of Jesus Christ, the indescribable gift at Christmas. I pray that as we, as we celebrate Jesus tonight, as we open gifts tomorrow, that we don't forget about just how precious he is. The reason we give gifts to each other is to celebrate his indescribable gift of himself. My prayer really is that if you don't know Jesus, that you'll spend some time talking to him today. There's nothing like a personal relationship, a forgiveness of your sins and walking with Jesus. It'll transform your life, I guarantee it. And if you do know Christ then we are here to celebrate his first advent, right? I pray that as you gather around the tree or whatever your family traditions are, maybe it's the breakfast table in the morning, whatever it is. Maybe for some of you, you're going to work in the morning. Just use, take a moment and thank Jesus for what he means in your life, for what he's done for you, for himself being the indescribable gift at Christmas time. And that's what I hope that you guys will take as you leave this place. Now at this time we're going to take a moment and we're going to we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And in a moment I'll invite the men up, but but as we come to the Lord's table, um, the Lord's table really is about us once again celebrating Jesus. It is very apropos that we that we engage in the Lord's Supper on Christmas as well as at Easter. Because guess what? When we take the 
the bread and the juice, and we, we celebrate what Jesus has done. We look back at that indescribable gift, that, that time in eternity past when he was born to a virgin as a baby. But we also look at him living many years later and dying on the cross for our sins, that when he went to the cross, he willingly broke his body and shed his blood for you and for I. So, so it's a time of reflection that I'm going to give you here in a moment where you do business with God, where you keep short accounts, where if, if you got something between you and God tonight, you just talk to him about it. He's always open-armed and he's always loving and always forgiving. And you just take care of that. It's also a time that we look forward to that second coming. This is the first coming, the first advent. But it's also a time that we look forward into the future. And we praise God that he's coming again. And we proclaim. The Bible says each time we take of the Lord's Supper, we proclaim Jesus until he comes, the scriptures say. So when we take of it tonight, we also proclaim what he's going to do when he comes again and sets himself up as Lord and Savior, King of the earth. What a beautiful time that we have for that.